You are beautiful and I love you. Imagine if every time my wife walked into the room, that's all I ever said. You are beautiful and I love you. I bet the first time I said it, she smiles and thinks, hmm, that's nice, and secretly thinks, what's he want? But then I carry on, you are beautiful and I love you. She's now looking at me with the look. Has Mark lost it? What do you want for dinner? She asked me. You are beautiful and I love you. And she's thinking, I can't get that in a ready meal from Esther, can I? You are beautiful and I love you. Well, I'm not sure we can go there this evening. How would Rachel cope with me saying this over and over again? I reckon no match, no matter how much Rachel likes me to say the words, you are beautiful and I love you. I think she would soon get sick of me saying it. She's trying to talk to me. She's trying to engage with me in conversation, but I'm not engaging with anything she says. Relationship is now impossible. We're not communicating. Now, I know this is a, a ridiculous example, and I'm sure that uh, nobody would ever be so stupid to try it on their partner. So why do people think mantras mindless repeating of, of words over and over again will somehow impress God. And yet they do. Um, hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad's prophet. Um, I am attracting all the love I dream of and deserve. Um, why would mindless repetition somehow impress an almighty God? Is God somehow less intelligent, less relatable than ourselves? Why would a bunch of people with religious Tourette's mindlessly reciting a bunch of mantras impress God? What kind of God would think, well, this is okay? I don't know. But I know that he's not the God of the Bible. God is personal. He's knowable. He's relatable. That's why I, I love the book of Habakkuk. Its message, I think, is as timely as it's ever been. And it teaches us that God is personal. God is knowable. Habakkuk himself discovered a bit more about what God was like, not through a dream or through a vision, but through a conversation with God, a question and answer session with the Lord. The God that Habakkuk meets is personal, he's knowable. Let's meet him, shall we? Habakkuk lived uh, a long time ago in a tiny kingdom called Judah, and he looks around at his the broken society that he lives in. It's full of injustice, it's full of violence. And Habakkuk sees all this, and Habakkuk, the man of God, lets rip with some pretty big complaints. Lord, are you deaf? How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Lord, are you powerless? How long, O oh Lord, must I cry out to you, violence, but you do not say? Lord, do you even care? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Lord, life's so rotten. Just get me out of here. Why do you make me look at injustice? Let's be clear. Habakkuk is not doubting whether God exists. Habakkuk's not asking questions about God because he doesn't know what he believes and he doesn't know whether to believe or not. No, Habakkuk knows God exists. The issue is this. Habakkuk knows God exists, and he knows the true, true and living God is, is, is good and he's powerful and he's loving, but he can't reconcile what he knows about God above with what he sees happening below. It doesn't make sense. He can't match the two up. Now, that's a question I think all believers ask at some point. How do you reconcile 
uh, the world that you can see with the God you can't see. What's the connection? Has God made it and then left it to its own devices? Or has God even noticed what's happening? And if he does, if he has noticed, does he even care? I love Habakkuk because he has the guts to ask the tough questions. He raises openly the questions that, that you and me, we want to ask. And I think any believer should ask. But what I love most, even more than Habakkuk asking these tough questions, is the fact that God answers him. God cares enough about Habakkuk to answer the cries of his heart. God answers him. He doesn't say, Habakkuk, know your place. Shut up. He speaks to him. God can cope with him and with us, asking the tough questions. Christian faith can handle the big questions. God wants us to know him and his ways better. God encourages, encourages us to, to search the scriptures, to, to know him more. And at times that can be pretty uh, disconcerting because you might discover that God isn't exactly like you. God doesn't fit naturally into the way that you do things. He doesn't see things the way you see things. God doesn't confine himself to the same echo chambers, the same Facebook pages and people that you follow. He has his own way of seeing things and doing things. God is not you. And that can be quite difficult at times, a quite difficult thing to face up to. And it was for Habakkuk. So God answers Habakkuk's complaint. Don't worry, Habakkuk. I've got this sorted. Before you even voiced your complaint, I was sending an answer. Really? Great things, Habakkuk. What's the answer? How's God going to, to remedy this terrible national situation which I live in? Is he going to send a revival? Is he going to bring about reformation? Could it even be revolution? Uh, none of the above. God says, verse 5, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you wouldn't believe, even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, to sweep across the whole earth, to seize dwelling places not their own. And okay with you. And these Babylonians, what are they like? Well, they are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law unto themselves. They promote their own honour. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. Brilliant plan, eh, Habakkuk? These wicked Babylonians will wipe out all the wicked Judeans off the map. Poetic justice, if you think about it. Here come the Babylonians, who are masters of every sin which the, the Judeans have merely played with. Now, if this was a cartoon, this would be the point when Habakkuk's eyes poke out on stalks. I can't be right. The cure is worse than the illness. What kind of solution is this? Let's say the, the Babylonians wipe out all the residents of Judah and they make their, their country and they just take over the country then God's solution will have resulted in a net increase in evil and wickedness in Judah this can't be right the Babylonians are worse than the Judeans this is not the answer Habakkuk was expecting I don't know what he was expecting but I know he wasn't expecting God to send the Babylonians to invade his beloved country. That wasn't even on his radar. I wonder what your response would be to that. My God wouldn't do this. I always remember that the teenager who said to me, my God wouldn't do this. We are having a conversation about the Bible and uh, we came to some bits which uh, some teaching which she didn't particularly like. My God wouldn't do this, she said. 
That's a common mindset many people have when it comes to God. We put God in a box. And when it comes to him doing something that we don't like, we'd say, well, my God, he wouldn't do this. My God would agree with me. He'd be on my side. But, you know, the God of the Bible is a lot more complex than we often imagine him to be. His ways are way beyond ours. We don't always understand what he's doing. We struggle to understand why, I don't know, why his laws, which he says are good, we, have, we struggle sometimes to say, well, why is that good? I can't, I can't see why that's good for us and for society. We struggle to understand how God can use suffering in our lives to bring about good. We say, no, that can't be right. Or we struggle to see why God will allow certain things to happen in our lives. Surely a good God wouldn't allow that to happen. I know it's uncomfortable at times, but God refuses to fit the formulas that we make for him. He refuses to climb into the box that we make for him. He refuses to give us all the easy answers we want. Habakkuk is facing a similar dilemma. How could God allow an evil empire to wipe out the righteous and the wicked? Verse 12. O oh Lord, your eyes are too pure to, to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the, the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those uh, more uh, righteous than themselves? Is Babylon to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Big question, isn't it? Is God siding with evil? Is God supporting uh, the Babylonians against his own people? How can God do that? How can God use an evil empire like Babylon to do good? And when will it end? God's answer is partly don't worry. Those wicked Babylonians, they will hammer Judah. But don't worry, I'll hammer them. They won't get away with it. I will punish them for their evil ways. And you can read about all that stuff in Habakkuk chapter 2. God pronounces a whole litany of woes against Babylon. Woe to him who builds his uh, realm by unjust gain to set his nest on high. Woe to him who, who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. God really cares about the injustice of the Babylonians and he will sort it. They won't get away with it. God says, don't worry, those Babylonians, they'll get their comeuppance. They won't escape my justice. Pretty tough stuff. And I know we don't like it. But we need to look at it, you know, because there's some gold hidden in these dark verses. Golden nuggets which give us uh, peace and assurance in our time. How about this for a golden nugget? Chapter 2, verse 13. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? Now that's a deeply comforting verse. It's also a deeply mysterious verse. God says the wicked nations, they won't prosper forever. They've got a built-in obsolescence. They're not, in, they're not omnipotent. They don't go on forever. They're not eternal. There's a built-in obsolescence. One day they'll be gone. They'll have their time and then they'll be gone. God makes sure that none of these wicked empires will stay too long. You see, God's in control of history. It's amazing when you think about it. Think of life from, from Habakkuk's perspective. Who could stop those mighty Babylonians coming out of the desert like a, a mighty unstoppable stand, sandstorm? There's nobody up to the task of stopping them. And yet there will come a day when a king of Persia will march into the capital city of Babylon and take it without a fight. You wouldn't bet on that outcome, would you? 
But it happens time and time again in history. Evil empires rise, look unstoppable for a while, and then they disappear. I've seen it in my lifetime. Apartheid, it disappeared without a civil war. The USSR, it disintegrated without a single nuclear missile being uh, fired in anger. When God calls, time's up. Those empire, evil empires are history. How comforting it is to know that God is in control of history. How comforting it is to know that uh, tyrants don't get a free reign forever. Here's another golden nugget. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labour is only fuel for the fire? That the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Do you get that? God tells Habakkuk, history is flowing somewhere. It's not a bunch of random accidents. The Bible doesn't paint a, a picture of God watching from the sidelines going, oh, I hope everything's going to work out okay. No, God's in control. This is the promise of Romans 8, chapter, uh, verse 28. God works all things for the good, for those who trust in him. This is that promise uh, written large, and it includes the rise of evil empires. God can even use wicked Babylon to achieve good ends for his people. Like he used the, the straight roads of the, the Roman Empire to make sure missionaries got the message to every corner of the Roman Empire. Uh, like he used the common language of the Roman Empire so those early missionaries could, could go out instead of having to learn 300 different languages, they could speak one language and communicate the good news of Jesus to all those different people of different nations, but all part of the Roman Empire. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. One evil empire is replaced by another. It'd be easy to think, looking at history, that well, history just goes round and round in circles, kingdoms rising and falling, rising and falling. But God tells Habakkuk, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The history of our world is progressing. It's heading somewhere. It's heading to a point where the whole world will bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is flowing towards that final victory when believers get welcomed into God's kingdom and when all those who stood against Christ will have to acknowledge they were wrong. When I read Habakkuk today, my heart is strangely warmed. Habakkuk tells me loud and clear, you can trust God's promises. Why? Because today, Babylon, it's no more. You can go to modern day Iraq and you can look around the ruins. That's Babylon, it's history, it's archeology. span it's gone. God kept his promise. His word is true. Someone estimated that uh, the Bible consists of about 20 to 25% prophecy. Now we've got all those prophecies about Jesus, but there's a lot of prophecies which we don't even notice are prophecies. They're prophecies about places like Babylon or Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenician Empire, or other empires. And at the time, they, they were part of, you know, contemporary life. But God said, no, whoa, when the time's up, you're gone. And now those prophecies are, have come true. And to us, they're archaeology, archaeology, they're ancient history. Actually, you know, they're not. When we go to Rome and we go walking around the Colosseum or something, we should say, this is an ancient history. This is fulfilled history. This is God fulfilling his promises. When we look around some ancient ruins, wow, Lord, that empire is gone, just as you said it would do. Wow, fulfilled history. There's a lot of it out there. Those evil empires, they came, 
they did what God needed them to do and then when they'd achieved that God said time's up no more and then the history gone Rome's done what it needed to do allowed the, the gospel to to spread um, it was a great time for um, for Jesus to be born with all those straight roads with that common language with a peace that we wouldn't have to cross from one war to one country to another good time for those early missionaries like Paul to go out with the good news in God's careful control God looked after the church he kept his promise and he's done it with Babylon as well Babylon fulfilled what it needed to do it gave us a seven day week it gave us Saturn's day Saturday it gave us Sunday it gave us moon day Monday it taught believers how like Daniel how to survive in exile in a godless land it's fulfilled its god-given role in history and now it's over Habakkuk reminds us we can trust God's promises he's in control of history we can trust him next week I'm briefly going to deal with the the good news of Habakkuk